Hi everyone, my name is PK and here I have uh, Suman and Jolly Dua with me there. You can see a power couple. Suman is a registered migration agent and also works with Jolly and vice versa. And Jolly is also a mortgage broker. And in this episode, it's not something I've done before, but we're really going to be doing a deep dive <clears throat> on how different people in Australia who are on temporary visas, different visas, how can they buy property or invest in property? What are the lending rules? What are the restrictions of what they can and cannot buy? What are the extra stamp duty, the FERB um, restrictions? If none of this makes sense to you, then you'll learn more about it as we go through. And as everyone knows, we've had almost uh, between five and uh, 500,000 and a million migrants over the last few years. So there's a lot of people wanting this uh, type of discussion, type of information on how they can also live the Australian dream. Um, so to speak, and I'm definitely not an expert in these types of visas and what property and, and lending can be afforded to such people. And that's why Jolly and Suman are very, um, you know, very graciously made time out of their very busy schedules to, to share their intelligence and knowledge uh, with me and with us. So I'm very uh, grateful to both of you for making time. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name's PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights or dropping ten dollars to $20,000 on buyer's agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. And I just want to read out some statistics just to kind of preface this discussion, um, just to set the tone right. So this is from the Centre of Population, um, which is a government agency here in Australia. And, and they actually found that Australia has the highest share of migrants in the OECD after Luxembourg, with more than 30% of the population in Australia actually being migrants. And this was twice the OECD average. Um, so the average was just 14%. And the second thing I just want to say real quick is that migration actually boosts the employment of Australian born population and does not affect its wages. The center of population in Australia found a 1% rise in the annual migrant inflow measured as a share of total population on average leads to a 0.53% increase in the employment of Australian born population. And that's true for Australian born people of all skill levels, ages, gender. So they all benefit from this part of positive effect. So I know that, you know, migration is, is somewhat seen in some camps as a social issue. And of course it needs to be, um, it needs to be done in a prudent manner by the government. But these studies have found again and again, that it actually provides an increase in productivity, wages, and and employment somewhat counterintuitively for the local population as well. So I just wanted to preface that and then really get into it because there's 30%, there's so many migrants here and I think they'll really benefit from, from this discussion. Um, and I should also say, which I think uh, Jolly, you reminded me of your in your email, that none of this is professional or, or personal or, or financial advice, is general and, and for generic purposes only. You guys should probably reach out to Suman or someone like Suman if you want sort of your tailored advice, but uh, I I think it's going to be probably a pretty long session, but very detailed and very informative. So stick around. Um, guys, before we get into it, did you want to say anything? Uh, that's exactly right, PK. So firstly, thank you for having us. Um, it's wonderful to be online uh, with yourselves. Um, and um, we love your work, um, as always. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, let's, let's kick it off from a migration topic perspective. In, you know, in terms of department policies, whether, you know, state or, or territory rules and, you know, just like the key regions where all these migrants are actually flowing into and settling down. Like, do we have any insights on, on that or, or, or numbers or future projections? Yeah, sure. So, um, PK, like, as you read the statistics um, initially, like, there is a lot of migration that's happening in Australia. 
So we do have like 30% of the population which are uh, migrants. So which shows that government is actually promoting uh, migration and giving permanent residency um, to a lot of people. So every year, Department of Home Affairs, they allocate 190,000 seats for permanent migration. But then as you know, like today's topic is for temporary visa holders, but there are like a lot of temporary visa holders which are in Australia and there is no capping for that. So they could actually be a number of um, these temporary visa holders who are here, which are not accounted for like in that permanent migration. So um, for example, like um, most of the applicants who come here on a work visa, which is like 482 visa, we've got like about 160,000 of those in Australia who are working, and recently there have been some changes, like some positive changes that have been announced. And now most of these people will be able to apply for permanent residency in a couple of years or maybe shorter than that. And then the other most popular temporary visa is the 491 visa. So I think that's uh, where most of your audiences are as well. Um, so the department has allocated about 30,000 seats every year for this visa. And this visa was introduced in November 2019, so it's been almost three years. So we're looking at about 90,000 of those visas that have been allocated. Now with this 491 visa, it is a regional visa, but we also call it like a provisional permanent visa because there is a definite pathway to permanent residency in the future. And then there are then I've got like all sorts of numbers. So I'm not sure how deep you want to go with that. Um, but every state and territory is allocated a certain number every year to give permanent migration to people who are living in their states. And um, just for the purpose of this um, session, you, usually New South Wales is like a topper, like they usually get like a lot of seats. For example, last year they got 15,000 seats for the regional visas. So people who can actually live outside Sydney, like they, uh, the department was inviting them to live outside Sydney. They are just not, not allowed to live in metropolitan city, um, Sydney, but they can live outside Sydney and 15,000 places were allocated just to New South Wales. So that's just to give you an idea, but then we've got numbers from each state from their own. Right, right. So is it fair to say that a lot of these um, migrants are initially living in regional New South Wales and perhaps regional Victoria? Is that a fair assumption or, or am I completely no. wrong? No, they could have moved from the cities to regional for the purpose of getting this visa because the condition says that then they have to live in regional area for three years. So that's why we see some people, I don't know, maybe they are interested to buy in regional because they're already living there. They are on a 491 visa. They know that they have a pathway to permanent residency. So then they kind of evaluate that should we um, buy a house now or wait three years, get the permanent residency and then get that, you know, first homeowner grants and things like that. So I think that's something Jolly will discuss because we have been dealing with a few of these cases and we have been helping these 491 visa holders. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's an exercise maybe Jolly can do. But just to give you an idea that, yes, it, I think it's like um, for 491 visa holders, they kind of have to evaluate their own situation and then make a decision because that's for sure if they've got a 491 visa, if they're living in a regional area, working there that's for sure that they'll get permanent residency in Australia after three years. Right. right. So the 491 is like, it's a guaranteed path to permanent residency. And and what was the other one that that you mentioned that is also popular, but is not a guaranteed path? Uh, like, yeah. can you know, where are, they, where are they going? Where are they living? So there is a 482 work visa as well. So when you hear about all these IT companies, you know, getting their people from overseas, so they yeah. actually um, use this visa, 482 work visa so again if i look at the maximum number of visas uh they are again in new south wales because all the head offices are there it's it people or hospitality workers you know they usually um you know use this visa to come to australia to work yeah. um until a few months ago some of them they did not have a pathway to permanent residency 
because there are like different lists. So I don't want to bore your audience with all that. But in brief, basically now everybody has got a pathway to permanent residency. So these might also be people who might be interested to know, is it worth waiting? Because there could be like a waiting period of two years to get permanent residency. Is it worth waiting two years or should they just rather invest now because it's for sure that they can get a permanent visa in the future? Right, right. And I think it was earlier this year, there was um, some changes made by Anthony Albanese where he sort of tried to pare back um, some migration into Australia because it went like ballistic up to half a million people a year. And then it's sort of coming back a little bit. What were those changes and, and how do they impact these visa classes that you're talking about? Yeah, so whenever they actually uh, do a capping or reduce the numbers, it's always about the permanent migration, not about the temporary visa holders, because there is no cap for the temporary visa holders like 482. 491 visa, they do have a cap. This is because they are definitely going to go on a permanent visa eventually. So that's the number 30,000 per year. But what has happened is that last year, department invited more people than the allocation. So now those applications are in processing. So that's why they're kind of not inviting a lot of people, but it doesn't mean that the number is affected. It's just that they may not invite new people because they kind of overdid it last year. Okay. So it's not that there's necessarily less people coming into Australia. It's just they overshot it. So now they've reduced it and they may increase it again if if they want next year or the yeah, year. So they coming. have actually not reduced the number. Uh, it's just that they have got like too many applications in the processing and to make sure that they can clear the backlog, they're just going to be a little bit slow and they want to make sure how the numbers go with the pending applications and mm -hmm. then invite new people for the permanent visa. Right, right. And, you know, you said if we include these two visa types that you mentioned, 482 and 491, I'll make sure I get these right. It's very confusing to me. Um, 482 and 491 we add these two together, how, how many visas are we talking about every year? And if we combine them, is still New South Wales the main place where they go? Or is it more scattered to like WA, Queensland, Victoria? I would say it's very scattered. Um, but the reference to New South Wales is just to give an idea, because it's a bigger state, it can accommodate more people, a lot of regional areas in New South Wales. So it makes sense for the government to actually give more seats to New South Wales. Then comes Victoria. They want to promote their regional areas. And Victoria is a bigger state as well, can accommodate a lot of people. So, of mm -hmm. course, they have to check the infrastructure of the state as well before they allocate these seats. But then we've got South Australia. They also get, I think they would probably rank number three when it comes to allocation. Then Western Australia, probably number four. So last year they were given 8,000. So mm -hmm. this year, like, I don't want to put too much uh, information about this year because things are slightly different. Like, you know how you said they are kind of, you know, they are not inviting yeah. a lot of people this year because of the backlog. Yeah. But I'm just uh, basically telling you the trend over last few years. That's how it has always been. Uh, if we look at the numbers, so 482 visa holders at the moment, I would say probably 67 to 68,000. But this is the figure I got as at September 2023, and we are in February 2024. So we're looking at about uh, 67 to 68,000 people as primary visa holders and then they bring the family as well with them so then mm -hmm. we might be looking at 130 140 people including their families um for the 491 you know it's like 30,000 per year allocation that actually includes the 494 visa as well mm -hmm. uh, which is like a 491 visa but it's just that you need an employer to sponsor you Right. So without confusing it too much, I would probably say 491, 494, same conditions, same everything. Mm -hmm. It's just that one is through a sponsorship visa. Right. But still have to live in regional area. So we're talking about that number, 30,000 per year. Uh, department has not released the data how many have been granted. Mm -hmm. But because they have these many seats, so I would assume if not, if they have not used 30,000, probably 25,000 a year, they should have used it because they have to use their full quota every year. Got it, got it. And perhaps one more question, and and uh, feel free to to share any, if anything I haven't asked you, Suman. Um, you were talking about the yearly numbers. Like, let's say at a point in time right now in Australia, how many people are there, including their family members, 
that are on these sort of two or three types of visas? Because from a flow perspective, a yearly perspective, it doesn't seem like, oh, there's hundreds of thousands, right? It's not such a big deal. But then, yeah. you know, it, it's sort of, they're all here and every year they come more and more and more. So how, I don't know, if, I didn't ask you to prepare this question. But I just thought mm -hmm. of it now. Do you know, like roughly, is there like half a million of these types of visas and their family members in Australia right now? Is it less? Is it more? Yeah, let's touch on a couple of other temporary visas as well. Sure. Um, we were talking about 482, 491, 494, because those are the most popular ones and would be interested to buy a home, so more relevant uh -huh. to this session. Mm -hmm. But for example, let's have a look at student visa. So we've got maybe half a million, 500,000 people, maybe 600,000 mm -hmm. people just holding student student visas at the moment. But you would not see those visa holders looking to purchase a home yeah. because it's literally a temporary visa no we don't know if they'll ever get a permanent visa but now and then you may get like a student visa holder wanting to buy a house mm -hmm. um so we're talking about half a million there and then all these student visa holders once they have studied an eligible course or eligible qualification in australia then they become eligible to get a work visa which is anything from 18 months to five years, depending on what they have studied. And again, there have been recent changes with that. Now some of them are getting five years work visa as well, which I think that's a long time to be here on a temporary visa. Just to add on that 491 <laughs> visas, mm -hmm. um, we talked about the regional areas. The interesting fact to make it simple, anywhere outside Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane Metropolitan is regional. Sure, sure. So you know how lenders and banks have their own postcode list? Um, the Department of uh, Immigration uh, regional postcode list is pretty much anywhere. Even like if, you, if you're talking Brisbane, um, Redcliffe, I guess. Is that right? Strathpine, Redcliffe. Oh, even Strathpine. Yeah, Strathpine, Redcliffe. Yeah, I mean, that's like Isn't middle it? ring Brisbane, yeah. but I guess it's yeah. technically just outside perhaps Brisbane City Council. So yeah. Something like that, yeah. yeah, so this list was actually updated in November 2019 when they introduced this visa. So before that, regional meant regional. But right. since <laughs> November 2019, like just the city areas are not regional. For example, in Sydney, like in New South Wales, Wollongong is regional, you know, for the purpose of this visa. Uh -huh. um, just coming back to the like 485, you know, the graduate work visa, I was just mm -hmm. looking at the number. So for example, as of June 2023, we had 200,000 of those people. Those are also uh, some of the, uh, some people who would actually go and maybe purchase businesses, go and look for, you know, to purchase a house and things like that because they know they are here two, three years. And some of them, they already have a plan how they're going to get permanent residency. And that's where we come in to help them um, achieve their permanent residency and things like that. So, but a lot of 485 visa holders, for example, would go for business loans and things like that because they want to mm. run a business while they have the work visa. Right, right. Um, and feel free to add anything else that I've missed. But one thing just came to my mind as well. Australia clearly has a skills shortage in various um, areas, hospitality, um, construction, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was, I think, just one or two years ago, it was also in like tech services, IT. I think that's perhaps a little bit more resolved now. Are these, you know, the visa holders, these temporary visa holders that you're talking about, are they the ones that are really plugging the gap or is it more the permanent visa holders, the permanents that are plugging these uh, skills shortage gaps? Yeah, I would say the temporary visa holders, because if you if I look at the data, because I did not pull everything out, because then there'll be like a lot yeah, of numbers. Yeah. But if you look at the data, like in general, most of these people who are here already, already having jobs, already working in these sectors, they are the ones who eventually get permanent residency, not the ones who are actually coming from offshore. Offshore might only be like 20 percent, I would say 20 to 30 percent mm -hmm. of people who get permanent um, visa through the skills stream. But mm -hmm. most of these students who are on the work visa, all these 482 visa holders that we, you know, the work visa holders, those are the people who would eventually go on permanent residency. Interesting. No, that's it's very insightful. Um, I'd love to to pivot more into like, you know, the types of properties they can buy, where they can get lending, uh, the restrictions, costs, etc. So like I will um I went through all the questions on 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 your Facebook post uh, together. Um, you know what people are asking and I've just prepared like you know, a list of those questions so I'll try to answer those sure. so um, just wanted to firstly um, 
you know, start with saying that all this information is fluid. It changes fairly frequently, at least every financial year. Um, we are talking about government, uh, government rules, which is FIRB, uh, which is, I believe, uh, part of ATO um, under Treasury. Um, so their rules uh, change, and then we're talking about Department of State Revenues in each state. And all of them, all of them have uh, different rules, different um, you know criterias, um, you know all of that. And then we are talking about lenders, the banks. Yes. So there's a few different um, you know uh, pictures in the scene. So um, yeah. So what I wanted to say is just keep in mind that this information you know may not be valid you know um, in the near future. So it's best to um, to contact your state revenue office, number one. Number two, uh, go to professionals um, like the, the solicitors and the convincer for stamp duties, exactly, you know, to find out what the number's going to be, um, to advise, like, you know, to get advice on, you know, um, for financial advice, you can go to your accountant or financial advisor sure. anyway. Sure. So, yeah, so that, that's, what, that's what my starting pitch was. Um, so, Let's start with FIRB. I think that's one of the main questions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, who are they? So they're basically a government department um, who's responsible for regulating foreign investment in, in the country. Uh, just to keep it simple, um, so they're in charge of it. Uh, whoever invests in in the country, uh, that includes foreign buyers who are purely um, foreigners. They do not even hold a visa, so they can just simply buy a property in Australia, being overseas. Um, and the most popular ones are, um, are the temporary residents um, who are already in Australia um, towards the pathway, um, for the pathway towards permanent residency. So they, these are the people who can, you know, who fall under that FIRB regulation. Mm -hmm. um, so who needs um, FIRB approval is um, pretty much the simple answer is anyone who is not an Australian citizen, a PR or a New Zealand citizen need FIRB approval. Right. So the rest of them are non-residents. Um, I will keep using these terms interchangeably. Um, non-residents, temporary residents, TR. Um, TR is temporary residents, obviously. Sure. Um, sure. So I'll keep using you know, them interchange interchangeably. Um, the exceptions, I mean, the exceptions uh, who do not need FIRB approval, um, obviously, um, Australian citizens, and if you are buying with an Australian partner, so if your spouse um, um, or de facto is an Australian citizen, PR or New Zealand citizen, then you don't need um, FIRB approval. The other exception could be sometimes those developers who um, you know buy um, and build to sell. They may have done a pre-approval, uh, FIRB pre-approval already. So if they have uh, a pre-approval already in place, then um, the the buyer, a TR buyer, doesn't have to go um, again to get the approval. Um, that happens as well. Got it. So, um, so I'll just keep reading the questions that are. Yeah, saw. go for it. Yeah. Um, first question: Can I buy a property as a temporary resident? Um, so the answer is obviously yes. Uh, you're normally permitted to buy uh, a property subject to conditions and restrictions. Um, the first uh, requirement is obviously FIRB approval. So once you've got that in place, um, then you have to think about, um, you have to do your numbers on your uh, stamp duties. So these are the two, two, two main things. So what does it take to, to buy a property in Australia as a TR? Uh, the main things to consider is the FIRB approval and the stamp duty. So the stamp duty is, is the um, is the regular stamp duty that all the residents pay, plus a stamp duty surcharge. And I'll go through those. Right. Uh, question, what types of property I can buy? Um, you can buy an owner-occupied property. So your principal place of residence, um, if you are... If you are buying your uh, principal place of res residence, um, which is to live in, then you may be able to buy an existing property, which is an established um, property, an established dwelling. Um, so that, that's a, that's a limitation. So you, 
um, an established dwelling can only be purchased by someone who wants to live in. Sure. Um, however, uh, you know, TRs can buy investment property as well. Um, yeah, so the investment property can be purchased. Um, so it has to be a brand new property where no one has lived in the past. Uh, it can be, um, you know, a vacant land that you want to build your house on or off the plan properties as well. Right. Um, one thing to consider is if in case um, you stop being, um, you know, you move away from Australia permanently, you you may have to sell the owner owner occupied property. Okay. But if you happen to purchase an investment property, you may be allowed to keep it. But then again, discuss it with your um, accountant uh, for right. for the ATO laws because that may fall under FIRB and ATO. All right. And when you say may, um, are you saying may because it varies from state to state, or it varies based on some other circumstance? Based on the visa. Uh, the based on how the property was originally purchased. Um, you know, if you happen to purchase a property with your spouse who's an Australian citizen, then obviously you don't have to sell it. Yes. Um, but the likelihood, if it's not the case, then you'll have to sell it. Right, right. Okay, interesting. For the owner occupied. For in, if it's an investment property, then um, it's possible that you, you'll be able to keep it. And could you convert the owner occupied? into an investment or that's no, completely can't. not allowed because it's an established dwelling? Yeah, I believe um, that's not allowed. Right. So if uh, you'd have to sell the property within six months if you um, stop uh, being in Australia or your TR visa is uh, declined and you cannot become, become a permanent resident, mm -hmm. then uh, you have six months to sell the property. Got it. So this is basically uh, to <clears throat> encourage um, you know, new developments yeah. in Australia. So this is a government policy where they want to, you know, you know, um, stimulate the the market. Like they want to um, incentive the the builders and the whole economy. Sure, makes sense. Uh, commercial property. Um, again, it is possible to buy um, uh, commercial property. So this is all now the topics against temporary residents. By the way, mm -hmm. so I don't have to keep saying for temporary residents. So commercial property, yes, they can buy. Uh, they need um, FIRB approval. Um, they can buy um, residential real estate or even businesses, as someone mentioned. Um, there could be a cap. There could be um, a, a minimum number where you need, like from where um, you need FIRB approval onwards. But it depends. Again, right. many of the answers is going to be depends. It just, it just sounds really complicated to me, like just on a tangent, you know, like in the US, anyone, almost anyone can buy any property there with almost no restrictions, whereas on other countries, they don't allow you to buy or foreigners to buy any property. Australia seems to mm -hmm. be like in the middle ground with a lot of like ifs and buts and do's and don'ts. Kind of, is that a fair summation of kind of the overarching policy from the government? I believe so. Um with the uh, say like the, the stamp duty costs and everything, so our average stamp duty costs are like seven to eight percent, uh, which is sorry the foreign buyers stamp duty surcharge. But in some other countries, it it it, it is like say in Vancouver, I heard, um, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the states in the other countries, they they are much much larger than than that cost. Right, right. Yeah. So how much does the FIRB cost? Um, uh, keeps changing every year. Um, so keep an eye what happens in July again. Currently, uh, under $1 million, it's $14,100 for the application fee for FIRB. And it's just recently increased, hasn't it? It used to be, what, around 6000 or 7000 Um Yeah, like, you know, a couple of years ago, I remember we used to do it for $7,000, $7,000. Sure. Yeah, you're right. Um, so from 1st July 2023 onwards, um, this is the fee uh, schedule. Uh, uh, 1 million or less is 14,100. Uh, 2 million or less is 28,200 and just keeps going up. 3 million, 56,400. It just, you know, for 5 million, uh, 112,000 odd. Right. So just I guess for, for the... most people that are buying sub 1 or 2 million, I mean, it's still not nothing, but it's it's not huge no. in the scheme of things. That's right. 
and it includes if you want to to buy a vacant land to build right right okay so um if someone was to 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 develop uh, the property like say for existing property developers as well there's a commercial schedule so the fee changes for them right. um as an example like the fees is about sixty thousand six hundred dollars um, for the property developers for okay. the FIRB approval. And they are required to report the sales of new and uh, near, near new dwellings every six months. A separate fee per sale will be um, payable for each dwelling sold to a foreign pers person under the certificate. So you know how I mentioned uh, they may have a pre-approval, so they have to keep reporting um, it to the ADO. So the um, developer has to pay initially um, to, to get the approval to develop. And then for every sale or almost near sale, then the developer has to pay per unit or townhouse or dwelling when the sale happens. Is that right? Um, I do not know the in-depth of it. Right. Um, however, the initial application fee is $60,600. Um, they may have to pay extra for each sale, which I am not too sure about at this stage. Okay. Something that I can look into. No problem. Um, some there, there's some other thing considerations uh, to keep in mind. There's a vacancy fee for so if um, as a temporary resident I happen to to buy a property, but then I'm like keeping it like if I happen to buy an investment property, um, and I'm keeping it vacant, then there's a um, um, there's a fee for that. It's called vacancy fee. Um, so any uh, residentially um, a residential property that hasn't been rented for 183 days, which is approximately six months uh, during a year, uh, is um, have to pay a vacancy fee. Uh, do you know how much that fee is? Uh, not on top of my head, but there's something that I need to look into. FYI. That's okay. I was uh, just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I think this might be because of the rental crisis. It you is. Know, when we have people coming in. To Australia and then they can't find houses to rent and then there are some houses which are like available but vacant so yeah. I think to reduce that they have imposed it and especially for the foreign buyers so a foreign buyer like we were helping someone who was buying from Singapore was buying in Melbourne um, mm -hmm. house and land package and if that person for example want, just want to secure the property and never rent it out there's a fine for that in a way. There's a penalty. That, so that's the vacancy fee. Yeah, it makes around. sense. I guess I, I understand that policy in the in the context of the rental crisis. Yeah. Um, you know, just on the side note, we we sometimes talk about Australian migration laws being very strict and all that. Um, I've been like a, being a migrant myself and been known other uh, people who like you know who even ha like you no know, work. There's a policymaker in Canberra. You know, um, what I can what we can see is. Australia is smart. Australian government, um, they take really good steps um, in a way to protect the, the interest of the country, as well as trying to look after the, the people who want to migrate. So there's a balance. I mean, sometimes we, we miss that picture. Sure. Um, but um, other countries even learn from Australian policies. Okay. I never heard that before. Everyone always bags out the government, but it's good to hear yeah. a balance. I mean, I never went through the migration process in the way that you, you're describing it earlier, Suman, because I was a citizen of New Zealand. That's where I grew up. So it was, you know, I think my dad took care of it when we came over when I was in high school. It was simple. But I think I just hear lots of anecdotes from migrants, a lot of which are my clients as well. And they're like, oh, my God, it's so hard. And they don't care about you. They're trying to exhort you for money. And, and there's that school of thought. And then there's a obviously other school of thought, which is like, well, it's a privilege to come to Australia because it's one of the best countries in the world, which it is. Um, but it's good to hear your balanced view that actually the government tries to take care of both parties. Yeah, I think when you actually know how migration works, then you think, hang on, this is like so easy. If you take the right steps, you are <laughs> definitely going to get permanent residency just because you have not taken the right steps, you know. So right. it's just like a re recipe, you know, like if you follow the rules, you get it. But mm -hmm. if you kind of uh, get distracted in between, then mm -hmm. yeah, then, then it doesn't happen. But coming back to that New Zealand thing, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you know about the new rules with that as well. Like Please. now, New Zealand citizens, they can, if they have been here four years on the triple four visa, um, they can just apply for citizenship straight away. So if they have been here legally, like four years, yeah. um, 
that's it. That's all they need to get citizenship in Australia, so which will make things very easy because before they have to first get permanent residency, yeah. um, you know, be a PR, like permanent resident for one year, living here a total of four years in that 12 months as a permanent resident, then they would go on citizenship, but now they have cut that part, so they don't need PR. So they are already considered right. permanent resident for the citizenship purposes, you know, as far as the citizenship law goes. Right, right. That's an interesting comment that you've made because I do remember now that you spark my memory because I came over in grade 12. Um, I, do, I was a permanent resident, like immediately almost, but I wasn't a citizen. And so I couldn't get a hex loan. I think that's that's what I'm thinking. That's reminding me of that. And just on that point as well, Suman, um, I'm finding like a lot of inquiry into my business is coming from New Zealand, New Zealanders, like Kiwis, they're either wanting to stay in New Zealand and invest in Aussie real estate because there's been a whole bunch of tax and policy changes in, in New Zealand real estate, or they're wanting to move over, buy a principal place of residence or rent vest. Um, are you seeing that as well? Like because of some of these changes, there's a, a kind of an influx from New Zealand into Australia? Yeah, I think that has always been the case. New Zealanders have always been interested to buy a property. So we do have some information about that as well. Uh, maybe Jolly can cover it now uh, for New Zealand citizens. But like if like you have been here for four years, then I would probably encourage that get the citizenship as quick as possible. Like if anybody who's listening to this show sure. been here four years, you know, um, like on proper visas here, um, just just get your citizenship because while it's there, why why not? What's and then the obviously things will be very easy for you if you're getting into investments and property market and things like got that. It, got it. Makes sense. So I don't want to um, interrupt your rhythm, Jolly. So feel free to talk about New Zealand or you can just carry on as you were. Yeah, like for, for New Zealand citizens, I'll touch uh, based on that um, when we talk about different visas, okay. um, because that'll fall into um, a flow of um, the questions. Sure. Okay, so we talked about vacancy fee last. Um, how much is a stamp duty? Um, you may uh, you may already know. Um, so the normal stamp duty is normal stamp duty, which is I believe about three to five percent. So um, that's payable. And then um, we need to pay an extra stamp duty, which is which is has got different terms in different states as well. So I call it foreign foreign buyers um, stamp duty surcharge. New South Wales eight percent. Um, Victoria 8%, ACT 0%. They, they have a land tax though, 0. 0.75, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so land tax is different. This is only the, the, the stamp duty. And is that, sorry to interrupt you, like New South Wales 8%, is that an additional 8% on top of the 4 to 5% already? So it's actually yeah. like total of 12%-ish of the total property value? That's right. So we'll do um, a quick exercise as well because someone someone asked that question as well. Okay. Um, as an example, how much does that cost? So we'll just go by a five hundred thousand purchase kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So um, stamp duty, normal stamp duty plus the surcharge, it makes, becomes expensive. There's sure. been a petition from some of our clients who have gone four nine one to the government. Like why? Like you no, know, I mean we are professionals either working in professional jobs or business owners and we are restricted to live in not live in Brisbane Sydney or Melbourne mm -hmm. and living in regional areas why do we have to pay such hefty surcharge um so there's a petition going on let's see what happens okay yeah I guess the government's making good money out of it so it's probably hard to change <laughs> <laughs> true um yeah so yeah, so uh, Queensland seven percent, uh, South Australia seven percent, uh, Western Australia seven percent, Tassie eight percent, and Northern Territory. Guess what? Zero percent. They're trying to bring people in. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, and you know. Why. And they really need people. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, There's a, a recent change as well um, to be verified. Uh, that in New South Wales, buyers from some other countries are now exempt from paying the foreign foreign buyer stamp duty. Okay. New That's Zealand, interesting. Finland, Germany, South Africa, Japan, Norway, India, and Switzerland. That's all. It's a random assortment of countries. Like is the UK is um, not in there or, or America is not in there? No. So these could be because of the trade agreements. 
um, Prime Minister Modi was here, and you know, a few months ago. I mean, and he signed a signed a you know trade agreement with the Australian government. Mm -hmm. You know, could it could could be that? So the additional stamp duty. What you're saying is, if you're from uh, Canada or Finland or Norway or India or New Zealand, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you don't have to pay that additional anymore. Obvious. But that's in New South Wales only, though. Only in yeah, New South Wales, which is what you were saying before, Suman, where uh, like a large chunk come in anyway, right? Yeah. Mm. And again, this is specifically for TRs. So if an, um, Canadian citizens just moved here and, and they are already a permanent resident, then it's not applicable. Right, right. So PRs don't have to pay this anyway. Do we have a number on um, what countries... Um, uh, like have majority of the tiers, um, as in like this. Yeah, so for most of these visas, it's like India is top. You know, when you look at work visas, student visas, um, any skilled visas, basically. So okay. India is top. Then we've got Philippines, we've got UK, um, and then other countries follow. So China is not in the top three. Uh, not recently. Um, because China, because Chinese people, they actually come here to study and all for student visas, they were to, uh, the top country from where we were getting student visas. That's like pre-COVID times. Um, but then they are not the ones who would really want to get permanent residency in Australia. You see, they just come here to study, then they usually go back into their country or they go for like, you know, we used to have the business visas, which are first now. So um, if I look at, you know, we had this significant investor business visa in Australia, which is paused at the moment. We are not sure what's going to happen with it. Yeah. So it's $5 million investment into Australia. So if I look at the data there, it's like mostly people from China who would, China, Hong mm -hmm. Kong, those people would get uh, that visa. But when you look at skilled visas, including the student visas, the 482 visas, India is, is the top country where we right. get most of the migrants from. Right. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, so these questions all align, you know, with each other, obviously. Um, so am I eligible for the first home buyer grant um, and the stamp duty concession? Unfortunately not, not as a temporary resident. So that's why, um, you know, if um, even as a first home buyer, I was buying my first property in Australia, I was paying, I was going to be paying the, the normal stamp duty anyway and no homeowner grant plus the surcharge. And they can't, like, you know, when a, a TR becomes a PR, um, you can't backdate um, either uh, to obtain these uh, benefits. Right, okay. Okay, so do I pay extra stamp duty every year? So there was a question about that. Um, this may vary from state to state. Um, in Queensland, for example, the stamp duty is only payable at the time of the purchase, and they are not there. There aren't any ongoing fees or taxes. Mm -hmm. Again, talk to your accountant to double check. Uh, many states have land tax, as you know, uh, depending on the status, uh, whether it's owner-occupied property or investment property. And um, land tax may not um, be charged on the owner-occupied properties, I believe. Yeah, they're generally not on the own. Okay. Yeah. But is there any, do you know if there's any land tax surcharge for being a TR, a temporary resident? Same as, um, um, same as normal. Okay, so no surcharge. All right. Uh, actually, there, there could be a surcharge or there could be a surcharge coming up. Uh, so they're looking at that policy right now? Yeah, yeah. So if there's a 2% uh, land tax, they you know, TRs may have to pay 4%. But, I mean, any legislation like that hasn't been passed from my knowledge yet. Right. And so you know how you're saying that for living in their own home, the principal place of residence, they can only buy established properties. These are temporary residents. For investment properties, they can buy vacant land or brand new, you know, house land package or something like that. Could they try to be a bit cheeky and set up a company or I know this is getting into like accounting land, which is perhaps not your area of expertise, but I thought I'd ask anyway, could they set up a trust or a company and buy an investment property through that um, and therefore not have to buy a brand new house or vacant land and buy established property or not have to pay that additional stamp duty, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, there, there are many things you can do, uh, PK, obviously, um, but 
what to keep in mind is um, the government is really strict. If they if they do happen to find that that was the the purpose behind it, then they may revoke it, and they may you may still have to pay back. Okay. So okay. it's it comes down to the intention. If they find out that your intention was solely like the the intention behind the company establishing the company was to avoid the stamp duty, then they may send you a bill. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, this is above my pay grade. I'm not an accountant either, but I'm just thinking, you know, there are certain legal laws in Australia where if you have a trust, you know, there's a certain legal privilege um, mm -hmm. and, you know, you're not, you don't have to disclose, you know, exactly who is the beneficiary of that trust, et cetera, et cetera. So it might be something for people to talk to their accountant about and really get to the bottom of, because it might be an opportunity or I might just be making stuff up and it's yeah. actually completely illegal, but just, just thought, you know, worth exploring anyway. Certainly for me too, um, it'll be worth exploring. Um, but then it comes down to the, the, the lender policies as well. Um, if the lender is looking at like who the directors of the company are, who the, who the trustees are, and it just comes comes down to, you know, that path. They may not get a, you know, mortgage. Right, right. Depends. Right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, I believe an accountant will be the right person to to speak to. Buying with a with a partner who's an Australian PR or citizen. Okay, so you must be buying the property with a spouse who who's an Australian citizen. So you don't have to pay a stamp duty. Mm -hmm. Um, or PR or New Zealand citizen, and then the lenders may assess your loan application as you were an Australian citizen. Right. So number one, um, uh, you should you should be you should qualify for certain government benefits as well because you're buying with a Australian partner, right. um, your spouse. Um, so you may get the first home owners grant as well. Um, and does that mean that? Um, both of your names, like both the husband and wife's names, must be on the title, or as a joint just, tenant. For, yeah, as a, yeah, as a joint tenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, only if um, you're buying as a joint tenant, you shouldn't require to get FIRB approval. Okay. Got it. And the stamp duty surcharge on top of the normal uh, may still apply, unless. You um unless you are only buying in the name of your spouse. Okay. So it could be 50-50. You may have to pay, like depending on what percentage of the, the value of the house you own, mm -hmm. you have to pay a stamp duty on that. Yeah. But then again, different state revenue offices may have different uh, rules on that. Right, right. But I think this is enough for people to at least know what questions to ask the relevant professionals and and at least have enough to to arm themselves to to explore further. So I don't I don't know a lot of these things myself. So I'm learning on the go. Thank you so much. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, capital gains tax for non-residents. Um, property accountant again. Um, I think. Like uh, what I know is the fifty percent of the CGT discount is generally not available for 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 the foreign buyers or the temporary residents. Okay. How you know the residents can avail that fifty percent discount? It's not available to the TRs. Right. Um. If you but, become an Australian PR though. Yeah. Then it changes. Okay. Then you may not have to pay that CGT anymore. Right. So if you, if you bought it as a TR, but now you become a permanent resident, um, you may skip paying the, the uh, i mean you may still get that discount life becomes e easy when you're a pr right um suman maybe a, a question for you it's kind of a hard question i guess but what percentage or like what proportion of people on these various tr visas actually end up becoming a pr like if i'm on a tr temporary resident visa should i be like really worried about property ownership and all these things because hey I'm my PR is not guaranteed things may happen or is it the case that actually most people get their PR it's just a case of following the recipe as you alluded to before following the rules and just waiting the required duration of years yeah so if we uh, for example if we look at 491 which we call it a provisional permanent residency anyway so those are the people who which I've seen are very confident into buying a property because they kind of know that 99.9% .9 they'll 
still get permanent residency. But when it comes to like other temporary visa holders, for example, 482, like I said, until now, the rules were a bit tiff, bit tough. Uh, but now the rules are changing. But then, you know, it also depends on your own comfort zone. Some people might just want to wait and want to see the permanent residency before they actually buy a, uh, buy a property in Australia. But then some are like, OK, they'll find out all the details. They'll do their numbers. They'll be like, OK, like, who cares? Even if I'm not a permanent resident in the future, am I still going to make money? Can I keep this as an investment property? So I think it depends on on like it's a personal thing. Um, but like if I look at the ratio, like what kind of people would actually go and invest, even when they know that they are a temporary visa holder, then it's the 491 and the 494 um, visa holders usually. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think this was one of the questions as well that we were perhaps going to go through, Jolly, and, and pre perhaps just to preempt that. I guess, correct me if I'm wrong here, Suman, but if you have a decent risk appetite and if the property market or the suburb or the location that you've selected is is rising a lot, then the additional, uh, let's say, you know, 7% yeah. uh, stamp duty surcharge, the FIRB cost of around $12,000, it's like, okay, it's it's a little bit painful. Yes, it is in the tens of thousands of dollars, maybe ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a sub million dollar property. But you know, I, I can probably stomach this because if I wait for my PR, which I don't know, it could take, I'm just making this up, two years, three years, by that time this property would have gone up like 20% or 30%, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's not for me to give anyone the answer to that question per se, but you have to do the math. And I think you can only do the math if you understand both sides of the scale. Um, you know, will the property rise in value? Of course, there's data to, to show what may or may not happen. And and on the other side of the scale, it's what both of you are very kindly sharing, all the rules, the, the surcharges, the fees and costs. It is a little bit complex, but if you get your head around it, you put it on this scale and then you can see, okay, does my risk appetite suggest, yep, just go ahead or actually, no, I'm risk averse. I don't want to make any mistakes. I don't want to take any chances at all. I'm just going to wait for my PR. Is that a sort of fair summation, you reckon? Yeah, I think when Jolly sits down and he does the numbers with them, like how much extra you're paying, most of them would still go ahead because like for the same reasons like you you have just mentioned. But then some people would be like, oh, because it's the deposit issue. So you do need a higher deposit, you see, when you're a temporary visa holder. But people who do have that higher deposit, they just take that decision and go ahead with the property purchase. But then some, they may have to hold on uh, because they have to, you know, get some more savings up. Got it. Yeah, that's a that's a clear critical path sort of milestone. You need a deposit in the first instance. Yeah. Um, no, awesome. Uh, please so, carry on, Jolly. So it's as sim like, you know, simply if you look at it, um, a 491 duration, a visa duration is about three years, and then they have to apply for permanent residency, which may still take another six months to 12 months. So we're looking at like anywhere between three and a half years to four years before you're permanent. Um, and if you're in a location like the regional Queensland, you know, further, further north, um, th those properties are going up like, you no know, so like you know, quickly, and so I mean, high very quickly. Um, so check, you know, how much rent you're paying versus how much capital grows you can, like, you no, know, you, you, I mean, you can project and then make a decision based on that. Sure. And uh, the other decision making point is usually um, I want to live in my own house. I know that I'll be permanent here mm -hmm. eventually. So might as well just buy like, you know, my property in Mackay. And then when I'm permanent resident, I want to move to Brisbane. Uh, but then I'll, this will be my investment. And then I'll move on and then I'll just use my um, equity to buy as a deposit to buy another property. So right. things like this is just a journey. Right. Um, yeah, and Piki, there are, there are always percentage of people like who just wait for their permanent residency and then they move to like Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, like metropolitan areas because they've just been waiting mm -hmm. to get the permanent residency to meet their conditions and then move on to the cities, you know. But then whereas these 482 visa holders, like, you know, we were looking at uh, the numbers, like, you know, they, they come in bigger cities anyway and they try to get permanent residency in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, you know, wherever they get the employers to sponsor them. So, of course, then they continue living in those states. Right, right. And perhaps a little bit off-topic question that just came to my mind. You know how, Suman, you were saying before how they re- 
um, the boundaries for what was regional versus not regional have shifted much more towards metropolitan areas. So there's also been like a huge influx of migrant communities in sort of Western Melbourne and Western Sydney, you know, in, in Melbourne around the sort of Hoppers Crossing and Tani and Tragonina type areas and Sydney around Schofields and, you know, that kind of Northwest Sydney. Are those areas considered regional in terms of the, the visa status or are they metro? metro? Like I'm just trying to understand why a lot of migrants. Yeah, I'll have to there. look at the postcodes, but for example, Geelong, you know, Geelong is regional for this yeah, visa. Right. And then I think there is Bendigo as well. There, Bendigo. Bendigo, is, Bendigo is regional. Yeah. So they have actually changed some of the like really city areas to regional as well for the purpose mm -hmm. of this visa. And that was in November 2019, because they were pushing people to move to regional and then people, like it was just not fair. And then what they did was they actually added more postcodes. So, like I said, for example, a Geelong, not really regional, yeah. uh, Strathpine, Redcliffe, not really regional, you know, so close yeah. to the city. Yeah. North Lakes is regional, for example. Uh, of course, Gold Coast is regional and that's like full city. <laughs> okay. So um, they have expanded those. So that's why. Uh, when we say regional visas, it's not like really, really regional because they have included um, some parts of the Absolutely. city as well. Mm. Okay, okay. So there's a list available, like you know, on on um, uh, Department of Home Home Affairs website on regional postcodes, and Got it's it. it's available to everyone. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on. So we're still on the part of um, the government uh, perspective. Really, we haven't even touched the lender side of it yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so New Zealand citizens, the the government rules you don't need you don't need an FIRB. Uh, you can buy a new property, existing property, or vacant land, uh, no issues. Uh, you can live in the property, or you can or it can be an investment. Um, just that you may have to pay a foreign buyer's uh, stamp duty if you are not in Australia at the time of the contract contract exchange or settlement. Okay, so, so just, New Zealand um, citizens do not have to. Sorry, can you repeat that? The, um, so the uh, the New Zealand citizens need to be in Australia at the time of the, the the contract exchange. Otherwise, they may have to pay the the surcharge. Standard. Right, but they don't have to pay the the FIRB twelve thousand dollars. FIRB no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So by twelve thousand dollars, you mean the FIRB? The FIRB. 40, yeah, it's fourteen thousand one hundred. Oh, sorry, my mistake. Fourteen thousand one hundred. I don't know why I'm making it cheaper. Um, um, under under a million. Right, right. Uh, under purchase, um, for the purchase under a million dollars. Okay. So, um, I think we touched on it. Um, what happens if uh, you're not granted PR at the end of the end of the temporary visa? So there was another question. Um, so if it was an owner occupied home, uh, you'll usually be required to sell it within the six months. But if it's an investment property, um, it's likely that you'll be able to to keep it. it. So if there was an international student here who purchased a property, uh, not by the way, the, the not all the banks would um, allow you to borrow, um, you know, on certain visas. So they every lender may have their own um, acceptable visas versus not acceptable. So if a lender's um, um, letting you buy and borrow um, on a student visa, and then half the money you just brought it from your, um, you know, from overseas or your parents are helping, then yeah, basically you come here, study and go back, but you still have got a property in Australia as an okay. investment. But that invest that investment had to be in the first place a new house, yes, where no one has lived. Right, right. Okay, yeah. very good, very good. Okay. Um, moving on to the lenders side, so lender side of the scene now. Um, um, so once, so we like, you know, now we're thinking in the terms of like, I'm a temporary resident. Um, I know what the FIRB uh, requirements are and how much my stamp duty is going to be, but I don't have cash to, to buy, um, you know, cash sitting in my account to buy outright. And now I need some loan as well um, to buy property. So uh, can I get a home loan as a temporary resident? Uh, yes, you can. Um, if you fall under the acceptable visa category uh, for that particular lender, um, 
you are able to get a home loan um, and you'll be able to get similar products or similar features as a PR or citizen. So there's um, not much difference, but it depends. I mean, it just varies from lender to lender. So th there are a number of different lenders in the market. Um, minimal for TR visas. Um, some are um, purely classified as private lenders, and they may have higher interest rates as well, but we'll touch on that. So um, which are the visa categories eligible to get a home loan? So from the FIRB uh, perspective, obviously, if you are a, if you're not an Australian citizen, PR or New Zealand uh, citizen, then you are a non-resident. So um, all of those non-residents, like not so um, are from FR, FIRB, from the government side of the things, you, you can go and buy. But now it comes down to the lender. Um, you have to check, you know, which lender allows my visa um, and uh, which don't. Okay, so the banks accepting TR visas um, are limited, as I mentioned. Uh, some of those visas are popular ones is 491, which is scaled work regional visa. Uh, 489 used to be um, the, the now 491. So a 489 superseded, was superseded by 491. Uh, 494 visa, which is the skilled employer sponsored, and they have their regional as well, similar to 491. Is that yeah? yeah. Um, 482 visa, which is um, the TSS labor agreement stream visa. So these are all the visa subclasses. I won't keep going down the visa subclasses because sure. yeah. it's a big list, but I'm only giving you some of the popular ones where like I get most of the inquiries from. Okay. Um, and um, they're bridging visas as well. Um, so bridging visa towards getting a TR and a bridging visa um, when you applied for the PR already. So, uh, and, and there are classifications. I mean, there are um, um, bridging visa A, B, C. I mean, there could be more. Uh, but my suggestion, like I personally believe, you know, if you are on a bridging visa, um, firstly, you're not acceptable uh, by many of the, most of the lenders. But, and because if you are if you're on bridging visa towards PR, then it's better to wait because the benefits will outweigh um, you know if you buy now. Got it. So with the bridging visas, you know there could be some applicants who are living on a bridging visa for more than one year because your their application is taking too long. But then you know it depends what app, what kind of application you have lodged. It can take anything from three months, sometimes even up to two years to get the visa that you have applied because of the slow processing times that we have in Australia. So yeah, in most cases, um, it's just better to wait for your permanent residency. But if you're sure um, that you're definitely going to get it, it's just a matter of time, then probably we, we could discuss in some cases, but depends what visa you're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the, there's some other visas as well, um, which are temporary but that then they may or may not lead to permanent residency. Uh, some lenders accept those as well, which is uh, a 485 visa. So that's more of a, a temporary graduate visa after you finish your um, higher education here, for example, and um, um, a student visa. So again, there's no guarantee that you'll become a permanent and you may not even have an intention to live here permanently. So those visas can be acceptable um, by some lenders. Okay. Um, then coming down, down to the New Zealand um, um, citizen visas, uh, 461 is a temporary visa. So I think it's a family family relationship visa. That's acceptable. Um, the, the lender policies may be different, but it's acceptable. Uh, and the 444, triple four New Zealand citizen um, special category visa is acceptable. Got it. Got it. Uh, question, can I buy a house to live in? Um, yes, existing property or new. Um, established dwellings can only be bought for a principal place of residence. Can I buy an investment property? Yes, um, a brand new property, um, you know, or, or buying with an Australian partner. 
your Australian spouse. And okay, so uh, how much can I borrow? How much um, will I be allowed to borrow as a TR? So most people are able to borrow uh, around 80% of the property value. Some lenders will only allow 70%. And you can go as high as 90% as well um, of the property value using the LMI, using lenders mortgage insurance. So it's, right. it's, it's plain and, you know, as, as, as for everyone else. Right. And I think you touched on it before, Jolly. Um, there's a higher interest rate across all banks for temporary resident visa holders? No. Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so it depends on the lender. Uh, private lenders, um, their offerings for TRs may be of higher interest rate. However, I know um, lenders personally, um, whom I've actually dealt with, dealt with. They'll um, they'll offer you the same interest rate um, and loan features as a as a PR or citizen. Okay. Yeah. So you're not disadvantaged. Right. Um, uh, point to be noted is uh, for foreign citizens living outside Australia, the rates are definitely higher. I see. Yeah. So. Um, for are you saying non-citizens that are just uh, let's say in I don't know living in China they want to buy an apartment as an investment property park their money for them and if they want to get they can get loans in Australia and, but the rate is higher what you're the saying the rate is higher and they're limited um, I don't I don't know many um, you know top lenders like non top banks lending to foreign buyers so they mm -hmm. are private private lenders. You can borrow like say sixty percent, sometimes seventy percent as well, uh, depending on you know how strong um, your financials are, yeah, right. and your profile is. And uh, we haven't touched on expats, and I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but just at a head, very high mm -hmm. level, let's say you're an Australian citizen living in the U.S. Obviously, you can still get a loan through an Australian bank to buy a property in Australia. Um, but some, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jolly a lot of banks will cap you at 80% LVR and there might be a slight interest rate premium. Is that a fair summation? Exactly. You got it right. So this is what the, the information I have as well. Okay. So they cap you at 80%. Perfect. Perfect. Um, then how much deposit I do I need? Um, then again, we touched on how much you can borrow. So the deposit part, we need to include the extra costs. So for example, like you are able to borrow, like say to the max of 90%. By the way, you can borrow up to 95% as well in some cases. Depends if you're buying with the, you know, along with your Australian partner. Right. So if I'm TR, but my partner's um, citizen, um, then I can go up to 95%. The, the normal lending criteria applies. Okay. Um, yeah. So deposit. So 90% um, is. For example, the bank's money, 10% is mine, but then the extra um, fees and duties payable. So the total contribution actually goes higher. Even if you're getting the maximum loan of uh, 90%, I would say your extra cost could be another 15% anyway. Right. So, right. Um, and if you don't want to pay lender's mortgage insurance, you're looking at 35% um, contribution. Okay, so it's a fair amount of deposit, which is what you were saying before, Suman, that often the decision is not, do I want to buy before I get my PR or do I not? It's, do I simply have enough deposit to actually do the transaction? But then, um, you know, some people um, are fine with paying LMI and they just go by 10% deposit and an extra like, you know, 13, 14% um, rough idea, you know, on extra costs. And they're still under 25 percent uh, of the uh, property price. Right. And they just go along with it as long as they're not just going with a really expensive property. You know, some people just want to go uh, away from that. You know, rental cycle. They just want to buy the first like townhouse, for example, mm -hmm. to, uh, even 350, 350 hundred thousand. You know. Got it. Um, Okay, so we touched on the interest rates already. So you don't have to pay extra. Um, you know, with some of the major banks. Um, it just depends on your profile and um, you know, and a strong employment history. Sure. Um, 
Someone asked if um, the structure of the loan is different um, if I was a PR versus TR. Uh, not really. Um, mostly the bank's um, general lending criteria and the product offering applies. Okay. So you can still get interest only loans and things like that. Yeah, I believe so. Sure. Um, we touched on the New Zealand citizens. Uh, anything that we haven't touched? I don't know. Um, someone asked um, if I need to be in, uh, like here for six months as a New Zealand citizen to be able to buy. I only know of New South Wales where uh, you need to be in the country for at least 200 days mm -hmm. at the time of the contract. Um, otherwise, I mean, if you're buying under that period, then you have to pay the stamp duty surcharge. Right. Uh, and Queensland uh, may also like you know apply the stamp duty surcharge um, if they find you entered entered Australia just to buy a property. Your intention. Right. Okay. It's very subjective. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure how you how they police that, but it's good to know. Well, you... at least they have. Um, they may or may not look into it in depth, but at least they have just put it out there. Yeah. So be careful. As a warning shot, but, so to speak. Yeah, but it's usually very hard to prove that your intention was different, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. How, like, you know, if you were selling a property, maybe then you, they can tell that you, their intention was just to invest. I don't know. Um, so I think that's really useful. Um, thank you, guys. A lot of questions we took. I forgot to say this at the start of the interview, but I posted on the Facebook group, Australian Property Mastery with PK, you know, for any TRs out there, you know, what questions you have. And so Jolly and Suman have very kindly gone through and collated those questions and tried to answer as many of them as possible. But I think perhaps this is, I don't know if it is or not, but I'm pretty sure this is one of the most comprehensive videos in Australia on this subject, both from a lending perspective, from a migration visa perspective, and also what and what they can't buy perspective. So I think you guys have done a, a tremendous job. Of course, we could talk about this per, uh, you know, for another two or three hours and still not cover all the bases, but that's what you're there for. So if there's anyone that, you know, actually wants to get a loan, you know, please contact Jolly. Um, he's also part of the Facebook group. I'll DM, I'll tag him in the, when I post this and you can DM him, I'll share his details as well. And I also should say, I don't know if we, you want to say this, but he's also a client of mine. So he's a terrific fellow. Um, and also Suman, I'll um, share her company details in the description. And so like, you know, there's so many, it's almost like unlimited permutations and, you know, like sort of what if this and this and this and this, like, so you need to actually speak to a professional about these things. Hopefully this was a fantastic intro uh, video to kind of whet your appetite and make up your mind. Yeah, I do want to explore property ownership in Australia, or maybe I want to, to stay clear of it for now. Um, but guys, did you want to add anything else before we wrap up? Uh, you've covered it all, uh, PK. Uh, you're right. Um, because these uh, rules and regulations are quite fluid and they're different from states to state. So it's better to to um, to get professional advice from your solicitor, convincer, accountant, financial advisor, um, mortgage side of the things. You know, um, feel free to, to to tag me and ask me questions. Um, uh, just the last thing I wanted to say is, you know, I, I get a lot of um, inquiries um, on from 491 uh, visa and uh, 482 visa holders, um, but they usually have. Um, you know, 10 or 20% deposit, they forget about that extra cost involved. So bear, bear that in mind. Um, if you have that money handy, then then it's uh, possible to borrow. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, best of luck um, and keep saving. Um, yeah. I'm sure you can get into the property ladder sooner or later. Um, Australia is a great country. Um, and, uh, and thank you, PK, uh, for all the knowledge, education that you've been spreading. Um, directly or indirectly, you have influenced so many people, including us. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I really appreciate your kind words. And I think from a broking perspective, at least I know sometimes I get, uh, you know, TR visa holders asking about these questions and I put them through to some brokers and those brokers don't know the answers because I think this is quite a niche specialty kind of um, knowledge base. So you do need to go to someone. I'm not saying you should go to Jolly and only Jolly and no one else, but you need to go to someone like Jolly, um, at least at the very minimum, who actually has a depth of knowledge in this space. And um, Suman from a um, migration agent perspective, I'm sure you'll run off your feet and you're very busy these days. Um, is there any last words or, or pointers or pieces of advice that you can give to someone who's kind of, yeah, maybe not sure um, about some of these topics or it's like, oh, it's too hard basket, it's so complicated, or even just in the migration process, they just need some words of encouragement and support? Yeah, I think um, when in doubt, always seek professional help. Sometimes things are actually less complicated than you think, uh, because when we like, you know, uh, you're, you're from the same background, giving advice and, you know, we are in the same profession, like, a, like you know, where we have to give advice. And when people find out, OK, they have these options they have no clue about because all they have been ch chatting to is their friends, which mm -hmm. are in the same situation. So obviously not not the right people to take advice from. So whenever confused, seek professional help, at least then if that's not for you, then you know that the answer is maybe no. And then you could, you know, move on with other things. But yeah, overall, I think we really had a great time chatting uh, to you, PK, and, you know, providing this information. And we are hoping that it has provided some value to your um, audience. No, I'm sure it has. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. We tried to uh, structure it and format it in a logical and sort of systematic way. I wasn't very helpful. I think Jolly did most of that. And so we tried to bring some legibility, but it's such a complex topic, but hopefully at least gave you some uh, info, intel and knowledge to be able to take that next step. Because who knows, you may be able to buy a property, whereas before you thought you didn't. And, and so that's always a good thing. Property ownership is always a good thing in Australia, guys. Um, once again, I'll leave their contact details in the descriptions um, below. Thank you for being part of the community. And thank you once again, Jolly and Suman. Thank you, PJ. Thank you.